but nobody would listen back then. <laughs> well, so good to see each of you, and Karen and I are very thankful to be here with you for our uh, homecoming camp meeting, where we're going to talk about living above the crowd. There's Mrs. Bachelor. We just uh, flew in from Sacramento, and we're so thankful now. It's one airplane from Sacramento to St. Louis. And so who knows, we may come more often. But uh, good to see each of you. It's always good to be back here at 3ABN. It's such a miracle the way the Lord has blessed uh, this vision. And, uh, you know, we have a, a downlink there in uh, Sacramento, Place 3ABN. We hear stories all the time about people coming to the Lord. And uh, it's just a, a, a wonderful blessing. You know, I'm very thankful to... Um, be able to be with you tonight and just to open the Word of God. In keeping with the theme, uh, living above the crowd, you know, the Bible says that um, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life and few there be that find it. Broad is the way, the crowd is on that road that leads to destruction. And Moses told the children of Israel, be mindful not to follow a multitude to do evil. And so, you know, being a Christian, uh, Jesus said, in this uh, wicked generation, it requires faith. And you've got to keep your eyes fixed upon Jesus. Now, in our message tonight, we're going to be talking about climbing the tree of life. And uh, I'm always fascinated with uh, amazing facts. And, uh, you know, the tallest tree and the biggest tree and the widest tree and and I've spent a lot of time in the woods working with trees. Sometimes I cut one down, I'd count the rings. But uh, one tree that's amazing to me, it's called the tree of life. It's the simple coconut tree. We just returned from Asia. We're in three different countries, uh, preaching the gospel, doing missionary training and evangelism. And we flew over some of those beautiful islands near the equator. And you can look from the window and you see the green emerald specks in the blue. And you know that there's trees there. They used to tell the pilots during World War II, if you get uh, shot down and uh, if you are in your little life raft, these primitive life rafts or your life vest, you can get to one of those islands where there's coconut trees. There's a good chance you can survive until someone finds you. Hopefully the right side would find you. And because the coconut, it's amazing. We did an amazing fact on coconuts. They make, of course, you got food, you got water, you can get milk, you got tools, make cloth. You can start a fire with a coconut tree. They make soap, they make baskets, building material. It's just absolutely amazing if you go through the South Pacific and visit some of those islands to see what they can do with that one tree. And so they kind of call it a tree of life. You know, the Bible begins talking about two trees. You've got the tree of life and you've got a tree that was the forbidden tree, the knowledge of good and evil. And because man ate from the wrong tree, we were evicted from the garden. And the whole Bible is telling us how to get back to the garden. And you get to Revelation, it says they're back in the uh, Garden of Eden, eating from the tree of life again. Well, I'm going to take you to a story about a man that climbed a tree of life. It's only found one place in the Gospels. And it's, it's really just the story of Zacchaeus. People hear that and they think, oh, Pastor Doug, I already did Sabbath school or Sunday school, depending on your background. And I know this story and I know the song about the wee little man. But I think sometimes we forget that these stories that we sort of relegate to the children are absolutely erupting with profound theological meaning. And I'd like for you to look at this story tonight with fresh eyes. Jesus entered... Luke chapter 19, verse 1. Jesus entered and he passed through Jericho. All right, got to stop already. This was the last journey of Jesus to Jerusalem before the crucifixion. When it says he passed through Jericho, you realize he's at the lowest point on the planet. 
The city of Jericho is in the Jordan Valley, not far from where the Jordan River runs into the Dead Sea, and that's 1,300 feet below sea level. And Jesus, you could say he's reached one of the lowest points, and the city of Jericho, one of the ancient cities of the world, was actually a cursed city. You remember when they marched around the city and, and the walls fell, and Joshua pronounced a curse on the city. He said, cursed is anyone who rebuilds Jericho. He will lay the foundation in his firstborn, and he will set up the gates in his youngest. And later, during the time of King Ahab, someone had the audacity to rebuild Jericho in spite of the curse, and his firstborn died when they laid the foundation, and his youngest died when they set up the gates. It was a cursed city. You see, Jericho, because of its location, is at the intersection of three continents. You got Asia, Africa, Europe, and you know, there's a forbidding desert that's to the east, and so the only way the caravan traffic went was through the Jordan Valley. And so it, it you know, went all the way back to the time of Rahab. That city was known for its um, bad behavior. And so as soon as we say Jericho, you know the story of the man who fell among thieves? He's going from Jerusalem, the city of God, to Jericho. And he falls on his way to Jericho. And so Jericho didn't have the best reputation, but Jesus knew that they needed the gospel there too. So on his way to die, he goes to the lowest city. And the Bible tells us, Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. I'll tell you a story. This guy owned a fitness gym, and in wanting to be a good example, he was pretty built. Matter of fact, he was overbuilt. He just, you know, he had the arms that were each that wide and very strong, exercising all the time. And one of the ways he would promote the gym is he had this um, little challenge that he'd issue. He'd say, for $50, I'll give you a chance to win $1,000. I am going to squeeze all of the juice out of a lemon. And if you can get one drop of juice out of the lemon after I squeeze all of it out, I'll give you $1,000. And so he got some takers every now and then. You know, these big you know, loggers and muscle men would come in and mechanics and stuff. And the, the, the owner would, he'd take that lemon and he'd squeeze it and he'd rub it and he'd get all of it out. And then he'd hand the messy pulp to someone else and said, you get another drop out and you get $1,000. They never could. And eventually this one guy comes in, and he's five feet tall, he's skinny as a rail, he's got these big horn rimmed glasses on, he says, I can do it. And everyone's laughing, he comes over, he plops down his $50 for a chance to get another drop out of this lemon. And so he goes right up there and he presses and doo -doo -doo, three drops came out. And everybody is dumbfounded that he was able to do that. And they said, how do you do that? How do you get so strong? What do you do? You lumberjack? Or you milk goats? Where, how do you get the strength to do that? He said, no, I work for the IRS. <laughs> so, <laughs> Zacchaeus wasn't greatly loved. <laughs> he was a tax collector. Except tax collectors back in Bible times were loved even less than they are today. Now, you know, there's legitimate people that we had one of our head elders for years was a tax collector. And um, a good man, honest job. You know, we, the Bible says there's a reason and a place for taxes. But in Bible times, the publicans, tax collectors, uh, their names were synonymous with the most wicked and sinful people in Israel. In fact, if... If you wanted to just put someone down and insult them, you know, you might call them a dog, you might call them a Samaritan, then you'd call them a publican. And that was just like, ooh, don't say that. Publican was as low as you could go. Now, what they did is they basically would buy a contract from the Romans so that they could extract taxes from their own people. And the way they did the taxes, it was kind of rough. I mean, you brought a wagon into town and you had your goats and stuff. And they say, I'm going to charge you so much for the goat, so much for the horns on the goat. And they kind of made up the rules as they went along. And they'd collect what the Romans required and everything on top of that they kept. And they lined their pockets by extorting their own people and giving the money to their enemies. So you can see why the publicans were not much appreciated. 
And Zacchaeus was not only a publican, he was the chief publican in the most lucrative city to be a publican, and it was basically what you would call organized crime. He was like the Don of Jericho. It was the underworld. And the people that the publicans typically hung out with, well, you know, they gave Jesus a hard time because he went to a feast at Matthew's house, and it said, why does your master hang out with publicans and sinners, publicans and harlots? That all went together in one phrase. And so uh, Jesus goes to this town. Now Zacchaeus, he was probably born a good Jewish boy, and something made him take a wrong turn. His parents probably had the best of intentions for him. His name, Zacchaeus, means pure, innocent, good, and he went bad. And maybe it was because he was short. You know, I didn't ruin the story. You knew that part already, didn't you? <laughs> I know, I hope I didn't spoil it for you. <laughs> but they say some people, when they're short, they get something called uh, short man syndrome. <laughs> they say that, you know, people like Hitler, Napoleon, and Alexander the Great, they were all like, you know, just a five feet or above. And, and they, they try to prove themselves, so they overcompensate by working, and they're driven because they want to be somebody. And maybe when Zacchaeus was a boy, everyone else bullied him and teased him, and so he became angry, and he just decided, the only thing that's going to give me power is money. And he did everything he could, and he learned how to um, manipulate and pull strings and, until he was not just rich, he was very rich. Well, let me tell you, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. Matter of fact, Solomon says, the more you possess, the harder it is to sleep. That's a loose paraphrase. And uh, you probably heard my testimony. My dad had millions of dollars. And um, at one time, he owned two airlines. And in our garage, Lamborghini, Ferrari, Jaguar, not all, Rolls Royce, not all at the same time. But I mean, a yeah, yacht in the backyard. And so... There was a lot of money there, and I'll tell you, there was a lot of misery. He drank himself to sleep every night. And, you know, I, I don't want to sound disrespectful, but I could see right away money does not bring happiness. A lot of people have found that out the hard way. They basically sell their souls. And Jesus said, what profit is it to you if you gain the whole world and you lose your soul? And you know it's true. The more you have, the more worried you are about what you have. And time, you ought to be out sharing the gospel. You've got to stay home to Greece and to monitor, to guard all your stuff. And the devil basically, he makes slaves out of many in the church because they can't avoid to leave their stuff to do the work of God because someone's got to stay home and take care of their stuff. It's not in the Bible. It's an old folk song. Freedom is another word for nothing left to lose. And in some ways, I know I was freer as a Christian when everything I owned fit in my backpack. And I just was walking with the Lord. And you become more, you know, you go from hippie to yuppie, and pretty soon you have all this stuff. You don't have as much freedom. Zacchaeus had arrived. He was, I don't know if he was famous. He was infamous. And he was wealthy. And he was unhappy. He was empty. And he was isolated. You know, if you're a publican, you couldn't go to the temple. If you did, everybody sneered. You were never invited to the house of anyone respectable. But he had heard about this teacher from Nazareth. And he heard that he even invited one of his inner circle from among the publicans. And that was a scandal. Jesus walked up and asked Matthew, follow me. And he walked away from his cash register and he followed Jesus. And then Matthew invited him over to his house and Jesus was eating with publicans and harlots. And so Zacchaeus was thinking, maybe there's hope for me. Maybe I'm not totally forever lost. And then, then he heard that Jesus told a parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, now you all know Pharisee, they were the opposite of a publican, at least outwardly. 
They were, you know, very scrupulous about carrying out all of the religious laws and very fastidious about their washing and their tithe paying. And, and they were religious zealots, praying long prayers in public so everyone could see how holy they were, making big donations in public and blowing the trumpet. And they were all about being religious and being holy and staying pure outwardly. But Jesus said they were like whitewashed sepulchers, many of them. And he said, two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, another was a publican. The Pharisee, he went up front and he stood and he prayed with himself and said, Lord, I thank you, I'm not like other men. I pay tithe of all that I have and I fast twice a week. And those are good things, by the way. And I'm glad I'm not like this publican back there. But the publican would not so much as lift up his head his eyes to heaven, but he bowed his head and he smote on his breast and he said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then Jesus stunned the crowd when he said, the publican went down to his house justified and not the Pharisee. And Zacchaeus is thinking, maybe there's hope for me. And so it says that Jesus was on his way through Jericho. Something else probably piqued his interest. If you read in Luke, the previous chapter, on his way into Jericho, Jesus heals a blind man. Now, the, uh, several gospels say he healed Bartimaeus, and then another gospel says there was actually two of them there. It's the same story, you know, some of the stories it talks about two, and sometimes it tells one of them who may have been the vocal one. But this miracle of someone who had never seen before and their eyes are open. And so the crowd of Christ is at his absolute peak. He is being thronged and mobbed on every side because he's just performed this incredible miracle on his way into Jericho. And Zacchaeus is thinking, I'd like to see a man like that. Maybe, maybe there's hope for me. Now, I can't, I can't overstate the importance of the next verse. And he sought to see who Jesus was. Seek and you will find. The Bible tells us that um, you'll search for me and you'll find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Jeremiah 29, 13. He was seeking for Jesus and Jesus knew that. You know, if someone were to say, what is the first step in salvation? I often ask uh, our missionary trainees in our AFCO program, explain to me how you get saved. What do you do? What are the steps? And people say, repent. That is definitely one of the steps. But I don't believe it's the first step because how can you repent unless you know there's something to repent of? I believe the first step in being saved is you must see the Lord. Because it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And when we see his goodness, it's like John the Baptist began by saying, behold, the Lamb of God. John, the apostle says, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called sons of God. We're invited to behold. Isaiah chapter 6, it says, In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord. After he sees God high and lifted up on his throne and the glory of the Lord and the angels around God, the holiness of God, he then sees himself by contrast and he says, Woe is me, I am undone. There was a thief on the cross next to Jesus. He'll be in heaven. You know why? He saw the Lord lifted up. Jesus said, unless you see me lifted up. Elijah said to Elisha, if you see me when I'm taken up. Christ said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Why? He put that serpent on a pole and he held it up where people could see. And when they saw that serpent lifted up represented a defeated serpent by faith. Then they got the victory over the venom of the serpent. What brought about Paul's conversion? He's on his way to Damascus. And Jesus appeared to him. He said, I saw the Lord. And when he saw the goodness of God and he heard the voice of God, he then saw himself and he repented and said, what shall I do? And this is the way it is with everybody. You really need to get a picture of who Jesus is. And this is what 
Zacchaeus wanted. He wanted to see the Lord. Notice what it says here. It says he sought to see the Lord, who Jesus was. It's not just what he sees, it's who he sees. He wanted to know, who is this man? This is life eternal, that they might know thee, John 17. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. It's not knowledge about prophetic dates. It's the knowledge of the Lord. Jesus will say to the lost, I don't know you. So how do we get to know the Lord? Conversion and godly living comes from regularly looking to the Lord. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, we fix our eyes upon him. And that's how we're able to lay aside the sin and to run that race. Zacchaeus, he wanted to see Jesus. Now, he doesn't just make an ordinary effort. He, you know, he kind of doesn't look around because he wouldn't have seen anything horizontal. He has to actually look up to think, how am I going to see him? The Bible tells us that uh, he had a handicap. It says he couldn't see the Lord because what? Everyone said short, but it doesn't say short first. It says the crowd. It wasn't that he was too short. The crowd was too tall. <laughs> no, really. If there was no crowd, would he have seen the Lord? Yeah. See, y'all look at it the wrong way. You come to a traffic signal. You call it a stoplight. But isn't it also a go light? Yeah, we always think of it that... You know, I, I just, if you haven't heard this before, it's really funny. And Karen has heard this a thousand times. I meet people who've watched the TV program for years, and then they see me in person for the first time, and they don't mean, but they just blurt out and say, you're short. <laughs> it, it happened again last week. It happens all the time. It really does. I don't know what it is. It's the position of the cameras in Sacramento where it looks up and it gives you a bigger than, I don't tell them to do it, but for whatever reason, it's not special effects. I look bigger on TV or something. And then they meet me and they're so disappointed. <laughs> and they say, oh, oh, you're short. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm concentrated. <laughs> but I tell you, I just... I, I like going through Asia because I was just in Asia. I'm not short in Asia. I want you to know. <laughs> so, he wanted to see Jesus, but he could not because of the crowd, for he was short of stature. By the way, we are all too short. We are all falling short of the glory of God. And unless we take some action and think ahead, we never will have that life-saving view that we need. The Bible says that um, he decided he had to do something to compensate. So how do you get taller? Platform shoes? That won't help much. You know, Jesus said, which of you by taking thought can add a cubit unto your stature? Not too many. The you know, cubit's 18 inches. I remember hearing this story once. You may have heard me share this before. Uh, I heard it on Paul Harvey, and I always repeat it as well as I remember it. I never saw it again. I never found it in print. But I remember him telling this during one of his, the rest of the story, stories. And there was this gentleman in Southern California that for whatever reason, his dream was to be a member of the Los Angeles Police Department. And I think he was Filipino, and so he was a little shorter than normal. And they have a height requirement in Los Angeles Police Department. You gotta be a certain height. And so, I don't know what it was. You know, you had to be 5'8 or something. I say that because I'm 5'9". But uh, so whatever it was, he was one inch too short. So uh, he asked to enroll in the police academy and they looked him up and down. They said, well, you know, technically you can go to the police academy, but you're never going to get hired by L.A. because they got this height requirement and they're very strict about it. He says, no problem. He said, uh, I, I think I'm not done growing yet. Well, he was like 21. But he was optimistic. And he said, it's one inch. I can figure something out. I can grow an inch. I want to enroll. And so he persuaded him. He enrolled in the academy. And he did very well. He excelled. 
and all of his classes and everything. They told him several times along the way, they said, you realize they're not going to hire you if you're not tall enough. I mean, just for practical reasons, you can understand that if you're just, you know, real short and you're trying to arrest, you know, a six foot nine drug dealer, it just makes it more difficult. So they got a minimum. And um, so he says, no problem. So he started doing all these things to try to grow one inch. And he had a bar in his bedroom and he'd hang from his feet and he'd hang from his hands. He'd hang from his feet until the blood rushed from his head. He didn't know why he'd just flip around, but he'd do that. And he found out that he was actually taller in the morning. Do you know you're a little taller in the morning when you first get up than you are at the end of the day because of the compression on your vertebrae through the day. You just shrink depending on your height up to a quarter of an inch. So if you want to look taller, get measured early in the morning when you first get up. <laughs> and, and then he even got these bungee straps. He would try to sleep at night. He had a med metal frame bed and he'd put these bungee straps on. He'd put them under his arms and on his legs and he'd try and pull himself during the night. <laughs> then he had, a, he had a friend at the, the clinic at the academy and he'd run in and he'd get measured. So he'd put it in his chart and he'd say, well, you know, I'm really impressed. You added a quarter inch. He said, but they're not going to they're not going to let you in unless you are the right height. He said, no problem. And he was doing everything he could to try to grow one inch, and he just wasn't getting there. So he told his mother, there's an operation. He says, the operation, they break your legs, and they put these braces on the outside of your legs. This is true. And they slowly pull the bone apart, and the bone begins to grow in and starts to fill in the gap. And it's very expensive, and I understand it's painful, but some people are, they've got the money and they're desperate enough to get that extra height, and you, can, you, know, you might get an inch or two. I don't know how much the limit is, but he said, I want to do it. And he told his mother, we've got to do this. This is my dream. I've thought of it all my life. He grew up watching the uh, LA chips or whatever it was, and he wanted to be a LA police department. And uh, she thought, we don't have the money. This is crazy. So one morning she told him, she says, I've got an idea. I have the solution for how you need to grow. Oh, he was so excited. She says, I've got the solution. She said, after breakfast, uh, I want you to look out the window and I'll show it to you. And so he ate a good breakfast and then he, she told him, she said, I want you to look out of the kitchen door, look up the street and you're going to see a solution. He opened the kitchen door expectantly. He looked out the door and why he wasn't looking, she took a cast iron frying pan and she walloped him over the head right on top of his head. <laughs> he fell to the ground and yelled and rubbed his hands. and said, why'd you do that? She said, quick, go to the doctor, get measured. <laughs> it raised up an inch about, above about three quarters of an inch on his head. <laughs> and the doctor at the clinic saw what he was going through to try to get that one inch. And uh, they said, look, he's going to kill himself. We better hire him. And he finally got the job. But if someone would go through all of that, and you can only grow that much, which of you be taking thought can add a cubit unto your stature? There's nothing really we could do, but Zacchaeus, he actually had a solution. <clears throat> and he sought to see Jesus who he was, but he could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. But then he remembered that there in Jericho on the main road where Jesus was going, he could see where Jesus was. He heard the crowd was coming. He saw them all pressing him. And he saw where he was going. He thought, he's going to pass down Main Street. And there's this tree on Main Street. Now, I was not the tallest kid in school, as you probably gathered. And... Uh, I went to an all-boys school in Miami called Curly. It was a Catholic school. And I one day was out on the field, and it was during recess, and everyone's out playing, and there was a bully in the school. And somebody went and threw a rock or something. I don't even know what they threw. They were behind me, and they threw it at the bully, and it hit him, and he looked at me. This is true. And I thought, well, oh, no, not me. And I turned around. They were gone, whoever had done it. And he started coming over to me like this. I thought, oh, he's going to kill me. He's a big guy. So I ran. And I'm very fast. 
And I ran around the back of the school and I jumped up into the branches of a tree and I climbed up in this tree and I remember seeing him with his entourage coming around. They are looking all over for me, but I hid myself in the tree and he didn't find me. He found me later in typing class. Another story, but I got kicked out of typing class because we got into a fight and we knocked over several typewriters. But anyway, I, I at least temporarily hid from him in the tree. And I thought, Zacchaeus, you know, he knew where that tree was, <laughs> didn't he? He thought ahead. He said, I remember that. That's where I used to have to hide from all the bullies. And so he made a plan to be where he knew Jesus was going. You know, if you put yourself in a place where you think Jesus is going to be, there's a good chance you're going to see him. The Bible says where two or three gather together in his name, he is there. And that means every Sabbath, you be where Jesus said he's going to be. Uh, when there's a prayer meeting, do all you can to be where Jesus is going to be. Surround yourself with the Lord. Now this to me is, I think, one of the most important things I say whenever I travel. I always repeat it because it's just so basic, but it's so neglected. You, you won't be a successful Christian if you don't love the Lord because you can't obey Him unless you love Him. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. You're not going to love Him if you don't know Him. You're not going to know Him unless you communicate with Him. You communicate with Him by His speaking to you and you're speaking to him in prayer. He speaks to you through the word, through sermons, spiritual information. The area where I think Christians are really failing is in feeding their souls and having an ongoing daily relationship with the Lord through a personal devotional life. And you need to be plain, downright, legalistic, and rigid about it. I mean, you need to say, I have an appointment with God. I might be tired. It might be inconvenient. I may not feel like it. But I am going to read his word and I am going to pray no matter what. Amen. It's not that you work your way to heaven by doing that. But you have to deliberately carve out that time or the relationship's going to suffer. You need to feed your soul. Zacchaeus knew where Jesus was going and he put himself in a place where they would have a rendezvous. And we need to make those same plans with the Lord. So the Bible says he... Uh, he ran. He made a superhuman effort. And he took a risk that um, people might make fun of him. He ran ahead and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. For he was going to pass that way. Now, the sycamore trees in Bible time, it's not the typical American sycamore that you see. Uh, it was actually a primitive form of a um, fig tree. They had the fancy, more cultivated figs, and then they had the cheaper figs. They called them sycamore. And it was a, a, it's a fig tree. And this is very interesting because uh, Jesus actually cursed one of those fig trees later on. It's also interesting because what did Adam and Eve use to uh, cover their nakedness? <laughs> These fig leaves. So he goes ahead and he finds this, you know, it's got a wide base and it's probably got some low branches. And if, you know, if he's a wealthy mafia don, he's probably not an athlete. <laughs> and it must have been a spectacle to see this, this short man, maybe even a little rotund, huffing up the street. He ran. He was in a hurry. You know, one of the things that amazed me, when David went to fight Goliath, the Bible says the giant went out to meet David and David ran. That always just absolutely shocked me that David would run to fight a giant. When you come to the Lord, you need to make haste. So he ran ahead. He got ahead of the crowd. He had to get away from the crowd. And he climbed. Now, he couldn't see Jesus because the crowd got in the way. What kind of crowd was around Jesus that day? Well, is it safe to say it was a religious crowd? Yeah, 
apostles were there. They were sort of the, you know, the inner secret service that were surrounding Jesus. And then there were, he had disciples that were with him. And then it even tells us there were certain women that followed him that ministered to him of their substance. And so there may have been some women and they may have helped in a special way. But he had this entourage of his inner circle and disciples. And then there were his enemies and spies and then there were just the curiosity people and the locals and you know then you get just the masses of people but they're all interested in this religious teacher you could say it's a religious crowd he could not see jesus because the religious crowd was in the way how often does that happen today what do you think the biggest obstacle is that prevents the world from seeing the goodness of god you know typically <laughs> The secular media, they love to uh, criticize Christianity. And the reason they criticize Christianity is because they point at Christians. They usually don't have something against the teachings of Jesus per se, but they ridicule those who claim to be followers of Jesus. The greatest enemy of the Christian church is professed Christians. That uh, they, they say one thing and they do another. This is what Jesus went right to the heart of when he began preaching, is religious hypocrisy. He started out saying, you fast to be seen of men, and you give to be seen of men, and you pray to be seen of men, and you try to look religious, but your hearts aren't changed. And you wonder, how many? If you were to just do percentages, what percentage of those who take the name of Christ really know Jesus out there? I think it's the vast minority. So if you're going to be a witness for Christ and if you're going to see Christ, you've got to get above the crowd. Amen. Bartimaeus wanted to be healed by Jesus. He heard the crowd was coming up the street to Jericho. He said, who is it? It's the healer. It's the teacher. It's the rabbi from Galilee. And when he heard that, he started saying, son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. And the crowd told him to be quiet. What did he do? Crowd louder. You got to be louder than the crowd. And he cried out. And you know what? Jesus heard him the first time, but he let him keep crying. God hears every prayer you pray, but you got to keep praying. And he said, bring him to me. He said, what do you want that I should do to you? He said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. He said, be it unto you according to your faith. And he follows Jesus. So, woman, she has a personal problem. I think I'm talking about that later this week. Wants to talk to Jesus, but the crowd's in the way. Has to get by the crowd. Jesus is in a house. He's teaching. They bring a paralyzed man. Can't get to Christ. Why? Crowd is in the way. What kind of crowd? Religious crowd. Have you ever met people, they stopped going to church because someone in the church hurt their feelings? Yeah, we all, that's a serious problem. Uh, and I never did understand it because they say, oh, you know, I, I like the Lord and I want to follow the Lord, but I'm not going to church anymore because of what they did to me. And, you know, they're all hypocrites. And, and so I'm just going to be lost. And uh, then when they're in the city of God and that lake of fire is creeping up around my ankles, I'm going to point to them and say, see, this is your fault. That's why I'm here as though you're going to get some relief from that. Why would you want to get even with the church by being lost? If you're trying to teach the hypocrites something in the church, then be genuine. But so many people get discouraged. And Jesus said, if anyone makes even one of these little ones stumble, it'd be better for them that they weren't born or that a millstone were hung about their neck and they were cast into the depths of the sea. We've got to be very careful that we're, we're not doing anything to wound people that are young in the faith or coming to church. So he said, I'm not going to let the crowd keep me away. Now, what did the crowd think of Zacchaeus? Not very highly. He probably normally had bodyguards because here he's taking all the tax money. He's taking all the money from everybody. But he wanted to see Jesus, so he climbed a tree. For he was going to pass that way. 
And then Zacchaeus is up there, and you know he's probably huffing and puffing. He gets into the tree, and he finds an overhanging limb, and he's somewhat hidden by the leaves, but he sees the entourage coming up the street, and Jesus stops and says a word to someone every now and then, and, and he's pressing on, and everyone's looking, and there's commotion and a, and a lot of noise and some rejoicing, and finally they're passing up the narrow streets, and they come right underneath where Zacchaeus is and says, Jesus stops. When he stops, the whole crowd has to stop because he's the, you know, guest of honor. They all kind of run into each other. And he thinks, oh, great, I'm going to get to not only see him, I'm going to get to him, hear him say something. But Jesus slowly lifts his head and he looks directly at Zacchaeus. And he preaches a very short sermon, but it converted Zacchaeus. You know what the sermon was? Zacchaeus. First of all, he knew his name. So Zacchaeus just about falls out of the tree. In fact, he may have fell out of the tree, and I'll explain later. <laughs> Zacchaeus, make haste and come down. When he says that, he's saying, come to me. For today, I must stay at your house. I think that his heart stopped, and he thought, God knows that I'm looking for him. This answers all the questions and the prayers in my heart is he knows me. He loves me. And Zacchaeus is so overwhelmed with the fact that God would not only know him, but that Jesus would want to be with him. Probably coming down out of the tree. I don't know if he fell right from the branch or fell on his way down, but a little later it says rising. So in order for him to rise from the ground, he has to be on the ground. Does that make sense? <clears throat> So I think he came out of the tree and everybody's snickering. You know, here's this, this publican, this Calvin Klein robes, and he's fallen out of the tree. And everybody thinks, oh, what's going on here? He made haste and he came down about as fast as you can. And he received him joyfully. How do we receive the Lord? Joyfully. The gospel's good news. And the incredible thing to me is he receives him joyfully. And look at what happens. It says, when the people saw it, they're all complaining, saying, he's gone to be the guest with him who is a sinner. Well, what did they think they were? This is the religious crowd. Was there anyone in that crowd that wasn't a sinner? But we think some people are worse sinners than we are. All sin will separate us from God. Zacchaeus does not let the church discourage him. They're talking, they're murmuring, this is nothing new. He says, Jesus wants to be at my house. By the way, do you know Jesus wants to be in your house? Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Jesus wants to abide in your house. The Bible says he stands and he knocks at the door, and if anyone opens the door, he will come in and sup with him. He wants to abide with you. The Bible says unless we abide in him, and he in us, we can't bear fruit and have eternal life. Zacchaeus is so overwhelmed with gratitude that Jesus wants to be his friend that he would receive him. It says he stood and he said, Lord, look, half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Now, why does he say that in particular? Because, you know, it tells us that in the, um, in the Hebrew law, if you took something from somebody illegally, if you extorted money and you robbed somebody, that uh, you would have to pay back fourfold when you did that. And so he was willing to give up everything. Exodus 22, verse 1, if a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it and sells it, he'll restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. And it says in 2 Samuel 12, 6, he will restore fourfold. That's what David said when he heard the parable of Nathan. So Zacchaeus knew the Bible. He knew what the law was. He knew what he had done. He said, half of my goods I give to the poor, and he, why did he keep the other half? Because he says, if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, well, there's going to be a very long line in Jericho. <laughs> he had to be very rich to be able to do that. Now, this is a fascinating thing because if you go back one chapter, there is a rich young ruler who is a good church-going young man and Jesus loves him and he says, if you would have eternal life, go sell what you have, give it to the poor, you'll have treasure in heaven. He couldn't do it. 
He went away rich and sad. And Jesus said how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of heaven. And the disciples can't believe that Jesus is saying this because they'd been hearing this prosperity gospel. The Pharisee says, yeah, if God blesses you, then it's okay to rob widows. And didn't Jesus say, you're the one who rob widows' houses and for a pretense you make long prayers. God's blessed us. And so here, Jesus, the disciples are saying, who then can be saved? The Bible answers that question in the next chapter with Zacchaeus. So here you've got the biggest sinner in town. He accepts Jesus. Jesus does not ask him to sell anything. He does not ask him to give anything to the poor. But he is so thankful, like Naaman after his healing from leprosy, he has to go right back to give something. He's overwhelming with gratitude, and he's willing to unload everything he has. Because he's realized, I had everything, and it didn't make me happy. And so... One of the signs that salvation had come to his house is he is sorry for his sins. He repents of his sins. And he wants to make everything right. He publicly confesses. If I've taken anything, a little bit uh, of a veiled confession, but he's confessing, they all knew. If I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I will restore him fourfold. And Jesus said, one of these days salvation will come to this house. This is the last verse. It's so important. It summarizes the mission of Christ. Today, salvation has come to this house because he is, not he will be. At the moment that he received Jesus joyfully, Jesus said, salvation has come to his house. He is a son of Abraham. He didn't say, I'm putting you on probation. That means as soon as a person surrenders and accepts Jesus, they receive adoption. He was being told, you are a child of Abraham, and I'm going to abide in your house. And his whole heart was utterly transformed. So the message is climbing the tree of life. All of us are too short. How do we add a cubit unto our stature? Jesus said, if any man would follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross. Where do you take your cross? to your crucifixion. You want to get taller? You got to climb a tree. But when you take up your cross, you are climbing a tree of life. And as Zacchaeus was not exactly what you would uh, think of when you're looking for fruit in a fig tree. But that was really the kind of fruit Jesus was looking for. He cursed the fig tree that was fruitless. But Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save the lost. What qualifies you to be saved? You need to know you're lost. Zacchaeus knew he was lost. And he was so happy that Jesus would receive him and forgive him. He thought, what profit is it if I gain the whole world and lose my soul? He was willing to give everything away that he might have that great gift of eternal life. You've probably heard before the incredible story of the testimony of John Newton, uh, the one who wrote Amazing Grace. And he was a, um, he actually was a slave trader, raised a Christian, mother prayed for him all the time, but he totally rebelled. And he just became a, a scoundrel. He was, matter of fact, he was such a bad sailor, the bad sailors didn't even like him. He was so bad that once when a ship was shipwrecked, they said, if we have to turn to cannibalism, the first one we're going to eat is him. <laughs> but he went through a dramatic conversion. Of course, pastor to church, wrote a number of songs, including Amazing Grace. And when he got older, he started losing his memory. And it got pretty bad. He'd stand up to preach, and he'd lose his way in the sermon. And Finally, he got to the point where he'd stand there and he'd say, you know, I don't remember very much anymore, but I remember two things. Jesus is a great Savior, and I am a great sinner. And Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. If you come to him and you say, Lord, I surrender, and I'll take up my cross, you climb that tree of life, he promises that he can declare to you that you are today forgiven. You are a child of Abraham, and he wants everyone here to have that experience. Is that your desire, friends? Amen. Can I pray with you as we close?
Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the promise in your word that you have come to seek and to save the lost, that your arm is not shortened, that you cannot save, that there is no sinner that uh, you cannot reach if we're willing to repent and to come to you. Lord, I pray that we'll all make that decision to, to, see, to seek after you as Zacchaeus did, to want to see you, to want to know you. And Lord, you've promised that if we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. That's what we're doing here this week. Please bless us with your presence. I pray that everyone here, everyone watching, might make that decision to take up their cross, to climb that tree, that they might see Jesus and experience the joy of salvation. We thank you and pray in his name. Amen. Amen.